Back in the summer, we took on one of our biggest Bike Radar Diaries challenges to date, as we tried to break the record for the fastest known time across the Trans-Cambrian Way, a mostly off-road route from one side of Wales to the other. The only difference was that we took it on as a relay, each of us riding a section of the route. And if you haven't watched this episode yet, then you absolutely must. It really is a classic. And while you're here, why not subscribe so you don't miss out on our next video. If you did watch that video, you'll notice we promised you an entire video dedicated to the noble steeds we rode. And while it might be a wee bit late, a promise is a promise. So here you go. Although it was back in June, the memory of riding the Trans-Cambrian Way is still fresh in my mind. And especially fresh in my mind is the Fairlight Holt that I rode for the day, which in the words of the brand is an unashamedly cross-country hardtail mountain bike. Now, unusually for these days, this very cross-country mountain bike is made of steel. And that's true of all of Fairlight's bikes. As a fan of steel road and mountain bikes, the idea of riding a steel mountain bike appealed to me. Steel is famed for its twangy bump and vibration absorbing ride quality. And I hoped on a rough day out on the Transcambrian Way, the Holt would give me a little bit of passive suspension to save my little rump. I also won't lie to being a bit of a sucker for style and Fairlight describe the Holt as being desert colored, whereas I much prefer to describe it as cream of mushroom soup. And that definitely appealed to me. Now, unlike Robin, I had never ridden in this part of the world. However, looking at the elevation profile for the day and the odd commute highlight, I knew I was going to face some pretty spicy descents. Now, I'm pretty confident I could have got quite rowdy on the Transcambrian Way on a gravel bike, but there's no denying that a mountain bike is the best tool for the job if descending fast is your primary objective. And as only a middling climber, I knew I would have to rely on my ever so slightly better than middling descending performance if I was to make up any of Matt Page's time. Finally, at the time of filming the original video, the Fairlight Holt was brand new, just having been released by the brand a few weeks ago. And I'm a sucker for new toys. So I rode the Specialized Epic Evo Expert, which is a cross-country full suspension shredder. It's a whole lot of fun to ride, managing to balance going fast with being capable off-road. As you might imagine from a cross-country bike, it has a lightweight FACT 11M carbon frame and comes with 120 millimeters of travel up front and 110 millimeters at the back. It rolls on 29 inch Roval Control carbon wheels with specialized 2.3 inch tires. So I had the benefit of having done the Trans-Cambrian Way route before, although I did it three years ago on a rigid fat bike and I had loads of gear and I did it over three days. So it was very different to what we did this time. However, it did mean that I knew I was going to encounter a lot of bumpy grass climbs, rocky bridleways and open hillsides. Could I have done it on a gravel bike? Yes, but would I have had as much fun? Definitely not. The Epic Evo seemed like a great choice for this ride. Its cross-country origins gives it a racy feel, and at only 11 kilograms, which for a full suspension bike is pretty good, it never felt sluggish. The Epic's ride is about as confidence-inspiring as you could want, with front and rear suspension and big 29er wheels. This made the off-road sections loads of fun. Finally, the Epic also has a super low gear for the biggest climbs. In my eyes, this is the perfect bike for trying to beat the record of the Trans-Cambrian Way. So I was lucky enough to take on this challenge aboard Laos' newest gravel bike called the Segler. Tom actually reviewed the bike earlier in the year. If you haven't watched that video, definitely recommend it. He awarded it four and a half stars, so I already knew I was on something good. And I may have been the only one on drop handlebars, but this isn't your typical gravel bike. It's definitely on the more mountain bike side of the spectrum and could even persuade those who swear by a hardtail for gravel riding to think again. It has a carbon frame with built-in compliance and big tire clearance, yet it has a super stiff bottom bracket area and weighs only a little over nine kilograms. So my section had pretty chunky boulders and deep riverbeds, but also some punchy road climbs where I needed to put the power down. So I was confident this was the perfect bike for the job. Now my bike was built around a Shimano XT 12-speed drivetrain. Out back, I had a 10 to 50 one tooth cassette, which was paired with a 34 tooth chainring. Now, I didn't face nearly as steep climbs as those experienced by Felix or Robin. However, there were some quite sustained long pitches, which were fairly steep and saw me towards the top of that cassette. 
If I was being really picky, I maybe would have gone for a slightly smaller chain ring, just because it's quite rare you find yourself right at the bottom of a cassette on a mountain bike. Even on the long road stretches, they were kind of a good excuse to recover, and on the descents, again, you're going much faster on a mountain bike than you would on a gravel bike, for steep descents anyway, and I wasn't really relying on a top end speed with a hard gear. I think it's true of almost all endurance racing where easier gears will always be welcome. There were a handful of occasions where I did have to get off the bike, one or two just because it was a very, very technical ascent, but even on sort of draggy, long climbs, slightly easier gearing would have been welcome. If I had built the bike up from the ground up solely with smashing fastest known times in mind, which of course I would be doing, I would even possibly consider a two by drivetrain. Now that's quite a retrograde option for a mountain bike, but that's just one man's opinion. What do you think of two by drivetrains on mountain bikes? Would you ever consider running one or are you one by for life? The start of my section of the Trans Cameron Way has what I can only call a green wall, which was a section of hill that was about 23% for almost half a kilometre. I was pretty glad of the Epic's gearing choice. The Epic Evo comes with a 12-speed SRAM XG 10 to 50 tooth cassette. This gives a very wide range of gears and a low enough gear for getting up most of the hills, although I did walk a few of them. I found that the shifting was always good and responsive and it moved quickly and quietly between gears. So though it had a gear that was really good for going up hills, I did feel there wasn't quite enough at the other end. The final bit of my section was a three mile sprint on flat roads and I could have had a bit of a higher gear at that point. Other than that, I was pretty happy with the range and how they felt. The bike does come with a power meter, but I didn't end up using it. Um, this is because I don't usually use one, but also the Trans Cambrian Way record wasn't really the time I wanted to find out how low my power numbers are. I rode the Weekend Warrior Wireless Edition of the Segler, which meant it came with a SRAM Rival Access Explore drivetrain. It's a gravel specific wireless electronic gearing system. This means it has a huge spread of gears for long, fast road descents all the way to those steep technical climbs. Perfect for the route I had to take on. Specifically, it has a 10 to 44 tooth cassette on the back and a 42 tooth chainring up front. For bike packing with a loaded up bike, I'd consider a smaller chainring, but I didn't feel I was lacking at either end of the cassette. I really liked how reliable the electronic shifting was. It never missed a beat and I could rely on it as sometimes I was mashing my way up and down that cassette. However, it wasn't all perfect. There's a slight delay from pressing the shifter to the derailleur moving the chain. And as I was effectively racing a time trial, I couldn't help but feel a little frustrated it wouldn't do things exactly when I asked it. But to be honest, the reliability of the shifts was probably more important than the speed, as I wasn't really going to lose any time over it. A shout out goes to the rival brakes, which I often tested to their limits as I came in hot into some of the many, many gates along the route. Eagle Eyed, among you might have noticed, it has a single sided power meter on this model but with all the craziness of filming and bombing around whales in the van, didn't manage to sync my Garmin with it. Now, it would have been great to have managed my efforts with a power meter, but I just wasn't organized enough. The Epic Evo Expert is a full suspension bike. It has a RockShox SID Select Fork at the front with 120 millimeters of travel and a RockShox SID Lux Select Rear Shock with 110 millimeters of travel. Compared to an enduro bike, or some trail bikes, this isn't loads of suspension. However, for the mixed terrain of the Trans Cambrian Way, I felt it worked really well. The comfort and confidence from the suspension made the descents absolutely loads of fun, and I imagine I had a much happier time bumping downhill than Felix or Jack. The Epic felt very happy carving a route downhill and felt far more capable than the small amount of travel might suggest. The stiff frame also meant generating speed over bumps was really good too. I spent as much time climbing as descending, and luckily the Epic comes with lockouts that firm up the suspension a lot so you don't wallow around when you're climbing or on the flats. On the climbs, as your cadence slows and you mash from the pedals, the Epic Evo sits in the initial part of its travel but doesn't hunker down and feels more stable and better supported, especially when you're standing up. Despite its steep seat tube angle, the Epic Evo feels like it sits you in a more comfortable, efficient position on the bike from which to tackle the steepest of climbs. The Segler came equipped with Laos' famous leaf sprung suspension fork, the Grit SL, giving me 30mm of travel by 12 glass fibre leaf springs. Ok, I'll admit 30mm wasn't quite enough in places and it wasn't tunable like Jack and Robin's bikes, but it was surprisingly effective at floating over rocks and lumps in the trail and of course it's super light. It bobbed up and down a little bit on the steep climbs, but the bike's geometry gave a nice climbing position 
so it didn't really make a huge difference to me. I'm going to stick to my guns and say the Grit SL suspension was the right choice for my route, which had a lot of flat out gravel and not so many mountain bike trails. Now I wish I could tell you something really interesting and clever sounding about high and low speed compression, volume tokens and general suspension tech, but I can't. It has been so long since I last rode a mountain bike that the sheer joy of riding down descents and not breaking my wrists on every bump was novelty enough to leave me wowed. Jesting aside, the stripped back and I dare say quite handsome RockShox Ultimate SID SL fork took almost no setup for this rather inexperienced suspension nerd. Other than setting the pressure to pretty much bang on what was recommended for me and having a little play with the rebound to suit my taste, really the fork just performed as I would want it to. There was next to no bob on seated climbs, even out of the saddle, again not a lot of bob and I could lock it out if I really wanted to but didn't feel the need to. On the long, chattery, quite fast gravel descents, it was lovely to have a bit of suspension up front, but on those rowdy descents, even with the fairly old school-ish cross-country geometry, the bike felt very confident and it was a treat being back on suspension. Out back as well, the frame is really heavily shaped for a steel hardtail. It uses some quite complex tube shapes with really nice S-bends and it does genuinely give a degree of lovely passive suspension out back. With the seat post quite exposed, and even though it was a dropper post, there was also quite a bit of fore and aft flex on that seat post. Again, adding just a bit of passive comfort when climbing seated on rough climbs. Clearance on the Segler allows tyres up to 29 by 2.5 inches, which is very impressive for a gravel bike. However, I rode the race proven 120 TPI Maxxis Ramblers in a 700 by 50 c size and of course set up tubeless. First of all, I was very glad that they had the XO casing because I didn't suffer any punctures or sidewall cuts, which was surprising considering I wasn't taking the smoothest lines. I would love to have maxed out the frame and ridden even wider tyres, but to be fair to the Ramblers, they weren't as draggy on the tarmac as I was expecting. As I mentioned, these were the 120 TPI threads per inch versions rather than the 60 TPI versions, which should have helped with the relatively low rolling resistance. Bigger tyres would have definitely been more fun, but I was actually enjoying riding against the clock, so I'm not sure if they would have actually made me any faster overall. The Epic Evo Expert is a 29er bike with specialised ground control gripped on 2.3 inch tyres on the front and specialised fast track gripped on control 2.3 inch tyres on the back. The tyres were fast rolling and capable. The route, when we rode it, was very dry and loose, so I didn't have any chance to test out what the tyres were like with anything wet or sticky. But they definitely handled the off-road sections with no complaints. Did they feel draggy on the road sections? Well, they did, and that's not a surprise because they're 2.3 inch wide. The compromise to slower sections was their impressive grip on rocky and bumpy parts. They were perhaps a little too gnarly though, and I did think the Felix would be a lot speedier on his louth in those road sections. Now the Fairlight halt I was riding came with a Vittoria Barzo tyre up front and a Mezcal out back. Now both of these are fairly shallow cross-country treads, and neither is designed for a kind of gloopy, muddy terrain. Lucky for me, as we mentioned in the original video, we were riding slap bang in the middle of a heat wave in Wales, a very uncharacteristic heat wave. Now I won't claim to be a real connoisseur of mountain bike tires, but for me, on the face of it, the fairly lightweight casing, the fast rolling tread, and the ability to set them up tubeless in a panic about a day before the ride was enough to win me over. The Specialized Epic Evo Expert is an awesome bike. To ride, it's speedy and responsive and didn't ever let me feel out of control and it simply eats up the miles. Was it a good bike for riding the Transcambrian Way? Mostly, yes. For a task like this, it ticked a lot of my criteria. It is quite lightweight, it has a good amount of suspension, which made it feel very capable, and it has low enough gears for the steepest hills. The only downside was the way it felt on the road, and I really wished for a drop bar gravel bike on those sections. I did think it was perhaps a little bit overkill for those parts. The main thing was how much fun it was to ride, and if you're not having fun, then what are you doing? I would certainly take it out again if I ever wanted to fail dramatically at breaking a fastest known time record. Now then, would I recommend this challenge on a gravel bike? Yes and no. Gravel bikes vary wildly. There are some which look like road bikes with bigger tyre clearances, and then there's the Lauf Segler, 
It's such a fun bike to throw down hills, yet is light, responsive, and can hold its speed when you just need to tick off some miles. Was it perfect? No, but I'm not sure there really was a perfect bike for this challenge. I felt like I really wanted a dropper post for making most of the descents, and the slight delay on the rival shifting wasn't great. And then there's a little bob of suspension, which could be annoying on longer road sections. But that is me being really picky, and I'm actually really sad to see that bike go, because I think it could be one of the best at being able to balance speed and control over mixed terrain. I was absolutely, utterly satisfied with how the Fairlight Holt performed on the day. Hardtail mountain bikes, when it comes to those sort of mixed terrain rides, as you're seeing on the Trans Cambrian Way, in my view, are the best option if you want to have fun descending, but you also want to be fairly comfortable on a long day out. If I was the sort of person who actually could have a crack at a fastest known time, probably a gnarlier gravel bike would be the better option for the day overall, in my opinion. But for us punters who yet want to have a good old whack at it, really tear yourself inside out on the climbs and try to go as fast as you possibly can, I think a mountain bike is probably the more sensible and I dare say safer option. The descents on the Transcambrian Way are by no means the most technical in the world, but you can go really fast on them. And the control that's offered by a mountain bike with wide tires and suspension just shouldn't be overlooked. Of course, if you just want to pull around the Transcambrian Way, and that's probably the best way to enjoy it, any bike will really do. Anything that's suitable for off-road riding anyway. Now that is just our opinion, but if you've watched our original Transcambrian Way video, and if you haven't, you must. It really is a very, very good watch. What would you consider to be the best bike for that day out? Would you go full gnarly send mountain bike? Or would you go for a lightweight gravel machine? Leave us your thoughts in the comments. The nerdier, the better. We do love reading them. We will reply to them. And as always, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the Bike Radar YouTube channel and click the bell icon so every time we upload a video like this, you will get a notification.